beautiful performance from Madge from the Middle Church Choir. Thank you. Thank you. It is such a joy to begin with the gift of your voice rising up and reminding us all that we have to rise up together. We're going to hear more from the Middle Church Choir later today, I promise you. But I want to welcome everyone now to the 25th anniversary of Lives of Commitment. I'm Katherine Henderson. I'm the president of Auburn. I so wish that we could be together in person for this 25th anniversary of lives as we were for 23 years. By this time, we'd be all dressed up to the nines and in our seats by 8 a.m. in a fancy New York City venue. I would have hugged at least 100 or more of you, which was my natural way, but now I'd be called a COVID super spreader. But the good news is, is that by going virtual, more of us can be together than ever before across the country and even the globe. You all can be in your pajamas at home drinking coffee and to honor the spirit of this pandemic moment, I'm dressed up from the waist up, but still in my jeans from the waist down. But wherever you are, we welcome you. You belong here. 
And let's just say this year has challenged and shaken us to the very core of our beings, and we need to hold each other tight, as Adrienne Marie Brown would put it, to make our way to the other side of this pandemic season, to a new day, and we can do it. We are here to celebrate the leadership of spirit and faith-rooted women working to build a world of justice where all can flourish and belong. These are risk takers, troublemakers, who are not afraid to stir things up to get things done. They're women who in some cases have put their lives on the line to create a world of justice and love. And their examples of what Auburn's mission has been about for more than 200 years, supporting and platforming leaders of faith and moral courage to power the work of social change. It is particularly exciting to me that this year's honorees are all connected in deep ways to Auburn. They are partners and friends. There are ties of relationship and shared work that bind us together with so many of you. You're gonna hear from Barbara Dopkin, feminist, an activist philanthropist rooted in her Jewish values of justice and a fierce ally of Auburn and precious friend to me. Alicia Garza, co-founder of Black Lives Matter, author, podcast host, and principal leader of Black Futures Lab. Imara Jones, host, on-air news analyst, writer, and creator of Translash Media as well as the beloved sister of the Sojourner Truth Leadership Circle at Auburn. Kifah Shah, an emerging leader, organizer, and strategist building power in Muslim American communities who joined us in our Friends for Life podcast, Organizing Circle. Irva Shibad, LGBTQ liberation trailblazer and visionary leader in activating faith to reject hate. We are so grateful to so many of you who've given generously to Auburn's work throughout this year and already through this event. You've allowed us to meet this moment in extraordinary ways during the pandemic and during an election season and aftermath, the fallout of which continues. Our world needs constant healing from all of us. And as you absorb the stories of our honorees and are moved by music and ritual today, we invite you to think about your own commitments to healing and repairing the world. And throughout our time together, we're gonna to encourage you to contribute to Auburn and to join us in this fight for a world of justice and love. Now shortly, I'm gonna pass the mic to Auburn Beloveds, Lisa Anderson and Mackie Alston who are gonna be our MCs for the day. You may know them as the co-hosts of Auburn's Friends for Life podcast. Now, Friends for Life is one of the themes for this year's Lives of Commitment. And let's just say it's our friends who are getting us through this moment. But now I want to show you the impact that Auburn is having in the world as we met the challenge this last year and as we look at our vision of the future. Take a look. It's been more than a year since we gathered at Auburn. Auburn has been that partner, that anchor, and pointing to the voice that people need to hear in times like this. I miss our gatherings twice a year. I just think we need that connection. That contact. That engagement. We found other ways of being in relationship with each other. Part of the joy of working with the Auburn team is being able to stay in touch with leaders across the country. And so we get to do that over email, via phone call, via Zoom call. We found other ways of co-creating our community. To meet this moment. And the next. By equipping leaders with the tools they need because prophetic voices are required in shaping institutions, narratives, and movements by intervening in communities with radical generosity because we're not in competition. At Auburn, we don't work in 
isolation. The work is about all of us, all of us here in this room and beyond this room. It's about collective impact, about friends and faith communities and nonprofits and corporations all trying to make a better world. By shaping collective social impact and movements for justice. To engage resources and unlikely partners. Toward a world in which we can all belong and can thrive. We are people of many faiths. I was born Jewish. I affiliate with Unitarian Universalism. I was raised Seventh-day Adventist. I'm a Sikh. I am a Jew. We are people of many faiths and none. We claim the legacy of religious pluralism that is at the core of this great democratic experiment. We know that justice only works when it works for everyone. We will dismantle white supremacy. In toxic Christianity. Toxic Christianity. Wherever we are physically. New York. Maryland. Los Angeles. San Rafael, California. Auburn is powering the multi-faith, multi-racial movement to fulfill the promise of this nation. We are stirring up the status quo to trouble the waters, to trouble waters, troubled waters, to trouble the waters, and, and heal, heal the, world. the world. Hey friends, and again, welcome. I'm here with my beloved Lisa Anderson. <laughs> Hello, sweet Mackie. Hello. <laughs> it's so great to be here with you and with all of you. Some of you may know us as long, long, long time members <laughs> of the Auburn team. And some of you may know us as the co-hosts of Auburn's Friends for Life podcast. But today, we're your hosts for this 21st anniversary Lives of Commitment celebration. And you cannot even imagine how happy we are to have come this far and to be here with you. Watching that Auburn video was so moving uh, as we think about this year we've lived through. And how about that song? Mm -hmm. Madge mm -hmm. Dietrich from Middle Collegiate Church singing Rise Up was incredible to think that Middle Church's building burned to the ground right before Christmas. Can you remember that? I remember. And still we rise. And don't even get me started about Catherine. Mm. So much beauty. I want you to know that as we record this show, y'all, we're playing it safe in regard to COVID, but we're still holding each other close. Mm. Yeah, how great was Catherine, that woman. Now, she's been our sister friend for more years than either of us want to admit. The Reverend Dr. Catherine Rhodes Henderson. Hello. Mm -hmm. So you might not be able to tell, but we're in Auburn's offices right now, and Catherine is just down the hall. We're beginning to move toward being together and learning to be together again. It moves our hearts. It is like medicine. Over the course of the next hour, we invite you to tend to your own healing and resilience as we celebrate and learn from our six incredible honorees. Kifa, Barbara, Irvashi, Alicia, Imara, and of course our very own Catherine. We hope that you feel love deep in your soul as you take in magnificent music from our community. Middle Church and more are coming back and did I say Bishop Yvette Flunder? Mm -hmm. Did I hear Rabbi Angela Bookdahl? I don't know, could be. Mm -hmm. So you may be watching this on your social media channel or on our YouTube channel. No matter how you got here, you are so welcome, beloveds. We are so grateful that you are here today. And Ramadan Mubarak to each of you celebrating this holy month. We're especially grateful that you've chosen to be in community with us today. Thank you to our sponsors and partners and all of you who have already given today. Your gifts make all of this, make all of Auburn's work possible. So in her introduction just a few moments ago, Catherine reminded us that in these very difficult times, it has been our relationships that have sustained us. I know that that has been true for me. Even though as a single person, I have spent most of this past year alone in my New York City apartment, I have still needed my people to hold me tight through it all. 
Think back, y'all. Think of all the Zoom calls, the phone calls, even the texts and the social media posts that have gotten you through. And this is not the first season of struggle, right? Think back to when the Zooming and the tweeting were not happening. We're elders at Auburn, it's a funny thing to say. Mm. I'm thinking right now about those who have come before who we've loved, right in this room and in the rooms that came before this room, some of whom we've lost. Everyone here carries grief as we gather, but we're also accompanied, right? We're held in their love and, dare I say, presence. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. So calling on the power of the people in our lives, whether near or far, and calling on the ancestors, recalling the lessons we've learned from the ones who have our backs, that's a big part of what our podcast, Friends for Life, is all about. And it's a big part of what we're about at Auburn. People often refer to us as a relationship shop. And that is because we know that without the capacity to go deep, really deep with the mm -hmm. people and the communities we care about, we could never imagine the world of love and justice that we are striving to co-create. And we don't always get it right, right? That's not how this relationship thing works. But we stay in. We do all we can to let love lead. We face into the trouble when we hit the trouble with our hearts set on the healing. So having said all of this, beloveds, I can think of no better way for us to ritualize our time together than to invite you to share in the chat the names and a little about the ones who help and hold you. Think of someone or a few somebodies who you would consider your friend or friends for life. Call this person or persons into your mind with all of your senses. Recall how they make you feel in your body. The sight, the sound, the smell, the touch of them in your body, mind, and spirit. What is it about them that gives you life? So now we invite each of you to name your person or persons and what it is about them that gives you life. The chat is open and the questions are there as well. We invite you to share in the chat who your person is and how they give you life. So, I'll start. While I'm blessed with so many beloveds, in this moment, <laughs> I have to say your name. Maggie Alston, you are my friend for life. And it's, it's the beauty of your spirit that radiates through your eyes, that radiates through your touch, that <laughs> radiates in your come on, mm. that you say, uh, that just cheers me on and that holds me tight. Thank you, love. You give me life. I love you, I love you. <sighs> so friends, as a way to acknowledge what you have written in the chat, or perhaps just shared in your hearts, Allow us to close with a collective blessing for you and your people. Close your eyes if you will, if you feel like it, and picture, smell, heal, hold the hand of your friend or friends for life. Beloved friend, how do we say thank you for getting us through? How is it that we might even begin to thank you for our very survival, for our joy, for hanging in with us when we make it rough, for being family? Sometimes we have the words, and sometimes words fail us. But we are bound together as beloved, so bless you, mm. bless you. Bless you, everyone. Mm. And now, I am delighted to offer you one of the songs that has been getting us through, sung by some of Auburn's truest friends for life. Rabbi Angela Bookdahl leads Central Synagogue here in New York City and served on Auburn's board for a whole bunch of years. She'll be joined by Auburn Senior Fellow Bishop Yvette Flunder. 
Uh, Yvette is the senior pastor of the City of Refuge United Church of Christ in Oakland, California, and presiding bishop of the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, and in my world, bishop of the whole wide world. So these two performed together on stage a decade ago as Catherine officially stepped into the role as Auburn's 10th president. Do you remember that, Mackie? Oh, yes, oh, I do. Yeah. That's when they sang Wade in the Water, and they encouraged us to get to the work of troubling the waters to heal the world. Today, they will sing Where Does the Time Go to ask us to look back so that we might be equipped to move forward in new formations. Across the morning sky All the birds are leaving Ah, how do they know It's time for them to go
So Lisa, so Catherine down the hall, you know where I first heard that song was in Lee Hancock's car. Mm. Y'all, Lee Hancock was our beloved dean at Auburn who died some years back. Lee was driving me to my first sick gudwara out in New Jersey. And she said, we had had the visit, she said, popped her tape in the car. If you want to cry, listen to this. And she was right, I lost it. Totally cried, broke down right then and there. Mm. I can so picture that scene. I can so imagine it. And oh my God, Mackie, you know what? It's the image of seeing those two women, an Asian woman and a black woman living in America in this year, singing with so much love for each other and for all of the people. It's been so hard, but they're still here. Right. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Bishop. Your friendship, your inspiration, your power have carried us through so much. Thank you for sharing your gifts with us over all these years. And now, beloveds, it's time for the main event, celebrating our amazing honorees, women of faith and moral courage who've been, who we've been highlighting across social media and email for weeks. For the first 23 years of this event, you would see our honorees come out on stage, uh, but this year we're really trying to lean in to this virtual event. Kifa, Alicia, Imara, Barbara, Irvishi, and Catherine all sat down with us to share who their own Friends for Life are, how they fought over the years to continue their justice work, and what keeps them going. As you listen to each of their stories, you'll hear how each of them has overcome insurmountable odds in their own individual journeys. But listen closely as they all share one common thread. We are honoring incredible women, each of them sharing how the humanity in each of us inspires one another to continue the struggle for justice and how we can build upon that humanity to create a more just future where all belong. Shaw, I go by she, her pronouns, and I'm a community organizer. This honor means a lot to me. I think most of all, what it first means to me is that no matter what, if you're in the background, if you're doing work behind the scenes, if you're not front and center or, you know, first top of mind, but you're doing the work and you're steadfast, it's valid, it matters, and it's seen. My name, Kifah, means the struggle. Doing advocacy work is actually innate. It's um, in my blood, it's who I am, it's in my name. And I also think that a lot of my work is rooted in all of the parts of me. So I'm a Muslim, I'm a woman of color, I'm an immigrant. I really believe in the work that I'm doing. I really believe in the work that everyone does when they're, you know, rooted in the principles of um, justice and dignity for all and freedom. I think a lot of the reason why I am where I am now in even my understanding of self um, and also in knowing my work uh, and, and what I want to do and what my life's work will be about is a lot about, you know, the people who came before me. So, of course, uh, all of our ancestors, but also my mentors. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with those friends for life. One of the people that I think of as a friend for life is um, Vina Duval. She actually is one of those mentors that really took me under her wing. I had seen her in college on a panel about Islamophobia, and to me, she was just tenacious. She was sharp, smart, and steadfast. And I went up to her, this was maybe in 2008, I was pretty gutsy, and I said, I wanna work for you. And and she was, the, at the time, the attorney at um, the Asian Law Caucus who was in charge of the National Security and Civil Rights Department. And she just looked at me and said, send me your resume, let's talk. Young people especially, and shout out to young people, I think I might be the youngest honoree. <laughs> but 
Young people especially have so much drive and so when somebody like Vina was was older than me and somebody that I looked up to just said yes join me um, she not only made me a friend for life but really was my mentor and guided me and she'll be an example for life too a concept of justice that I've learned uh, in Islam like as a Muslim is um, putting things in their rightful place so not just things but you know putting systems in the right way uh, putting society towards its right way right I know I, I'm not an Islamic scholar so <laughs> that is not a direct quote but it's a it's a paraphrased idea around um, something that the Prophet Muhammad told us which is that if you see injustice at the very least the very least of faith is to hate it in your heart uh, but what's better is to speak out against it and what's even better is to act against it at the end of the day I will never be able to do anything except for fight for justice for folks because um, not only is it a part of me and my history and my name, but also because it's the one thing that really allows me to feel like at the end of the day and at the end of my life, I will have done um, and fulfilled sort of my purpose. My name is Alicia Garza, and my organization is the Black Futures Lab and the Black to the Future Action Fund. We work to make black communities powerful in politics, and I have been a part of justice work for almost 20 years now. It's been a while. The work that I do is really working to make sure that people know that they can be the superheroes in their own stories. That's how I describe organizing, it's how I describe movement building, and it is the work that I commit myself to. You know, one of my favorite stories of this work is uh, I met a woman years and years ago, and at first she was someone who every single time I would knock on her door, she would slam the door in my face. <laughs> every single time, but I would keep going back, learning more about her, learning more about what she longed for, what she dreamed about, and what scared her. What I learned was that it's very hard for us to imagine ourselves as the heroes in our own stories. So often, we are waiting for someone else. We think somebody else is gonna take care of it. We think somebody else should take care of it. But there's something beautiful that happens when we move from that point to realizing that there is something that we can do. And when we join up with other people who care about the same things that we do, who also long to be the heroes in their own stories, we can accomplish incredible incredible things. This work is difficult and sometimes as practitioners in this work we don't always feel like people have our backs. It's really easy to kind of focus on the haters. But one thing that I've learned is that there are always more people cheering you on than people waiting for you to fall. My partner Malachi is somebody who I first saw on the street, we had no idea who each other was, uh, in a protest. And I remember catching eyes of someone who took my breath away. The person who I would marry and be in relationship with for more than 20 years. One of my closest friends uh, also is somebody who I learned to organize with. And she became somebody that I can't live without. She was standing right next to me when I married Malachi. So there are so many people in my life for whom being brought together through this work also means that we're being brought together through our lives. We go through the phases of our life together as we are going through the phases of social change. And those relationships are the ones that I cherish the most. I'm so grateful for all of the people who I know and who I don't know who are cheering me on and subsequently cheering us on. Faith and spirit for me is the process of being connected to something bigger than myself. Um, it humbles me and reminds me that I'm but a speck in this huge, huge sea of people and interests and needs, wants, desires. But spirit also reminds me to stay present. In my 
practice. I spend time talking about all the ways in which I need to forgive myself and ways in which I can be more forgiving. Um, and also really clearly articulating what it is that I want to see. What is it that I'm trying to bring forward into the world? And knowing that these hands can do a lot, this brain can do a lot, uh, but there are some things that are beyond me too. Uh, and so for me, it's a process of being connected to that which I can see, feel, and touch, and that which I cannot, but that I know is guiding me. Thank you so much. It's an incredible honor, and I appreciate you all thinking of me and loving on my book and loving on the work that we're doing together. Thank you. My name is Amara Jones. I am the founder and creator of Translash Media, and I have been in justice work when I think about it in totality for about 20 years. I'm thrilled to be an honoree this year for Open Seminary's Lives of Commitment. Translash is a journalism and personal storytelling project which aims to center the narratives of trans people but specifically trans people of color in this moment of backlash. We create lots of different types of media which centers our humanity so that we can be seen as human and therefore decrease the actual physical and policy violence that is directed against us. We tell trans stories to save trans lives. And it started um, because people urged me to tell my own story. I was resistant to that. I think like a lot of trans people, there is um, an idea that people may not be interested in our stories, don't care about our stories, um, and also a reticence in the truth that you have to bring in order to tell stories, which means confronting a lot of hard stuff and a lot of things which are uncomfortable for us to relive and to think about. I think there's a tremendous amount of responsibility that I feel in this moment. I think black women always feel responsibility <laughs> and responsibility for the world. Um, but beyond that, I think that as a black trans woman who has the ability to be heard in this moment, there's an added amount of responsibility to use my voice um, in a really powerful way. It's also um, a tremendous amount of responsibility in terms of convincing people that I'm important, that my community is important, and that the work is important, and that they should support and listen to us. Telling stories and generating understanding is actually how we create faith. Every faith tradition is a compilation of stories. Every single one. And stories which guide you, stories which reaffirm you, stories which give you wisdom, stories which show you how to survive. And so finding a way to do that in modern times for the most marginalized of the marginalized, I can't think of anything else that underscores faith more than that. Well, the good news is that I have many friends for life. Yeah, I think that like in those challenging moments, like when you're in the crucible with other people, when you meet people under those circumstances and connect with them, those are bonds for life. You know, I believe that when we look back on this moment, 50, 100 years from now, that we're going to see that the issue around gender identity and specifically the intersection of gender identity and race was one of the most important issues of our time. And that it is the pivot for human rights. Because if we get this right, we actually can get everything else right. It is, it is the hinge. And at the same time, understanding that there are, in the middle and surrounding that, other issues and other people that we have to care about that also connect with these fundamental issues around human rights, gender identity, and race. Hi. 
I'm Barbara Dobkin from the Dobkin Family Foundation. I feel like I've been involved in justice work for my whole life. It's not fair. My mother used to joke that those were my very first words. I grew up in the 50s when girls and boys had clearly prescribed gender roles. It wasn't fair, I know this will sound ridiculous, that my brother was permitted to drive on the newly completed Baltimore Beltway while I, the girl child, was not. It wasn't fair that black kids were prohibited from riding the roller coasters at Gwyn Oak Park. These are a few of the early examples of how I began to understand injustice. The indignity of it's not fair that people endure across lines of race, class, gender, and religion. I struggled to belong in a world that afforded me a strange mixture of privileges and disadvantages. I learned that it's not easy but you really can't give up. I have wanted to throw in the towel several times. I don't think that I ever looked at myself as a powerful person. It really has taken me years to develop, I mean, people find this ridiculous, but to, to develop a voice of my own. I was determined to improve the quality of women's lives and deepen my commitment to justice. In the 70s, I fought for reproductive rights and the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment. I became immersed in women's funds. By the 80s and 90s, I became especially outraged by how unfairly women were being treated in the Jewish community. By establishing and investing in the leadership of the Jewish Women's Archive, of advancing women professionals in the Jewish community, and especially Mayan, the Jewish Women's Project, we sought to open up spaces for Jewish women to thrive. My values, I think, are Jewish values, and they have led me my whole life. I don't think that they're only Jewish values, but um, they're the ones that have meant the most to me and directed my work. I actually feel like it's holy work. Uh, probably the most pleasure I've gotten from my philanthropy has been supporting young women in their quest for what they need to accomplish in order to do what they want to do in the world. Seeing the young women who are coming up now, or who were coming up when, when we were 25 years ago, who are absolutely having impact in the women's community and in the Jewish community. Um, that's the best because people always said, oh, you can't, you can't rely on the next generation. Well, you really can. And they're doing some terrific work. Only when we learn enough about ourselves and each other can we bring into being a better world, a world that cherishes our shared humanity, a world where everyone belongs. I feel humbled by the attention you are giving me today and especially honored to be among these tremendous, influential, groundbreaking leaders and activists, including the exceptional Katherine Henderson. I accepted this honor because I know that I represent so many of us in this room who are still in the struggle, striving to move from the protest of It's Not Fair that took root in our childhoods to the fundamental repair and profound transformation we need to have individually and collectively to build a better future. In sharing a small part of my story, I hope you will catch glimpses of your own, harness your moral courage, build meaningful relationships relationships and take new risks in the service of justice so that we can all know what it truly feels like to belong. My name is Irvashi Vad and I've been doing social justice work for Oh gosh, over 40 years. To understand the work that I'm doing now, which is constructed partly as a consulting firm, the VAD Group, and then partly as a, a little think tank that we have that's affiliated called Justice Work. And to understand it, you have to see the work that I've done behind it, which is for many years working in the LGBTQ movement as um, in different roles in different places, and then also working in philanthropy for uh, 10 years 
and two different foundations to fund social justice work. I trace the kind of sources of my social justice activism to being an immigrant. Uh, my family immigrated from India when I was eight, uh, to being a woman, to being a woman of color, to being a lesbian, and then eventually I got trained as a lawyer, so the oppositional part of me really got stoked by that. <laughs> but I, I think being uh, an immigrant gives you that double consciousness that Du Bois talked about. You see multiple cultures, you see them from different vantage points, and coming from a very poor country, from a family with very modest means to this country, was eye-opening. And then we moved here in the 60s. I identified so deeply with the social movements, the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement, especially that were out in the streets. So that informed and influenced me. And I got really the sense that action can produce impact early on. And I had that commitment early on. We're getting involved early on in the LGBT movement. You know, we had an organized opposition and it's the same opposition that opposes immigrant rights. It's the same opposition that's opposed to changing structural racism or addressing white supremacy. It's the same misogynist, patriarchal opposition. Many activists I know feel burdened by the weight of everything and get overwhelmed by it. And it's totally overwhelming. I think my partner is a great saving grace for me and I feel very uh, grateful that I have that. My partner in life, Kate, and I met at a movement conference in 1988, and we've been together 33 years. It, one has to build a support system in order to survive in this work, whatever that means to you. I really have wanted to center work on the right wing more. We have an initiative called the 22nd Century Initiative, which is looking ahead to how we secure a social justice future in the face of all this opposition. So it's about developing strategies to address the right today, but it's also thinking ahead about what infrastructure we need to build, what leadership, what capacities we need to invest in so that 20, 30, 50 years from now, long after we're gone, the community of practice around social justice has a fighting chance. I think we have to think like that because there's nothing given about a progressive turn in history. When I say we, I think of people working for racial justice and racial equity, people working for gender justice and gender equity and economic justice and economic equity. What we're trying to bring about is a really profound realignment of power. We must anticipate that resistance and engage it and try to explain to people why the world that we're offering is actually a better world than the world where it's headed today. I think, you know, in the world that I envision and that most of the social justice activists I know envision, there's a, a space for a lot of difference, political difference, religious difference, expressions of faith that are performed differently, lives lived differently, but within that there's a lot of freedom and space. Thank you so much to Auburn Seminary for this honor. Um, not only am I moved that you find the work I've done meaningful, but I'm humbled to be among this incredible group of honorees. You have no idea how much it means to me to be honored by you today as I host my last Lives of Commitment and prepare to step down as president of Auburn later this year. You know, I'm thinking today of my parents, Leela and Arnold Black Rhodes, who grew up in the brutal, racialized South of North Carolina. My mother's father, Big Daddy, that's what they called him, helped to found a high school for black students in the county. And my mother remembers being awakened as a child in the middle of the night as the Klan, on horseback, robed with torches burning, circled their home to harass my grandfather for his actions. 
and consequently my parents fed me the powerful nourishing food of faith and justice as a child when we marched in the streets for civil rights in Louisville, Kentucky. We were a mashup of people and then we ended up in the John Little Mission singing together. That body memory, that DNA has guided my footsteps as president of Auburn, has animated my dreams as we have with partners all over the country brought to life in new form this leaderful movement for justice to build the multiracial and multi-faith democracy where all can flourish. You and we are weaving together the relationships and networks that will use power well, use power for good, to accomplish the world that's never been but yet can be. Of this, I have no doubt. You know, being Auburn's president is the gift of a lifetime. It's the perfect constellation of spirit and justice that has guided me since childhood. I sort of think of Auburn as a living, breathing entity. It's at once a wise, grounded 200-year-old matriarch and also an innovative, fierce, and loving presence. Auburn is alive in the people, in the staff and the board, in leaders of faith and moral courage all over the country and world. Auburn lives in the vision and values that drive so many to work for voting rights, to love blackness, to fight against white supremacy and oppression in all its forms, including toxic Christianity, to become a nation that cares for children and old people and immigrants and the planet herself. You know, I have worked hard for Auburn to grow into its full stature and potential just as I want that for all the people to whom we're accountable, who are often on the margins and passed by, unseen and unheard. So you know, along with being the president of Auburn, I'm also the president who's a minister, called by God through the most unlikely invitation of a stranger as a sophomore in college, but that's a story for another time. But you're like a big congregation, a big multi-faith, multi-racial, sprawling congregation, sometimes fractious and confounding, but more often a source of infinite fascination and delight. You have made me a lifelong learner. In my role as president, I have prayed with you and I've prayed for you. Being at Auburn a long time means that with many of you, we have lived so much life together life passages and seasons and births and deaths and marriages and divorces and bat mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs and high holidays and marches in the street where we almost froze or expired from the heat, mountaintop gatherings, trips across the world, and lately Zoom calls, including with Auburn staff and animal companions, puppies and cats who sometimes walk the runway across keyboards. I feel such an enormous gratitude for all of you who've been with us on the journey. You help Auburn to take risks, to innovate, to fail and try again and succeed. If I started naming you, which I could because I love you, we'd be here all day. I want to name three though, my beloved partner in life and love, Chuck, our daughter, Julia, our family, and our beloved four-footed Springer Spaniel Maisie, short for Amazing Grace, one of the most wonderful pandemic companions you could hope for. And to the echo the theme of today, Friends for Life, Auburn is a friend for life, and that goes for many of you. So now I'm gonna go full stop and exercise my presidential privilege to put on my ministerial role and end with a blessing for each of you that comes from an ancient sacred text and expresses the words of my heart. Now go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak and help the suffering. Honor all beings. Love and serve our God. Or you could say, love and serve something greater than yourself. And may grace, love, peace, and joy be yours this day and even forevermore. 
And so, dear friends, we move from blessing to blessing. Join us as we bless this year's Lives of Commitment honorees. Kifa, strategist, organizer, facilitator. Your work rooted in Muslim American communities weaves stories and relationships into the fabric of our social movements. Your intersectional analysis hones what solidarity looks like. As this water passes over your hands, I offer you this blessing. May your opportunities to pull the world toward justice grow to meet your ambition and vision. May you find family from all corners of our movement who will be your friends for life. Imara, sister friend, storyteller, platform builder. Your work provides a home that offers both a shelter from hate and a space for liberation. You make a way for trans folk everywhere that expands our understanding of what it means to be held in wholeness and wellness for all. As this water passes over your hands, I offer you this blessing. May your voice always resonate with power and purpose. May you receive as much love from the community as your full heart pours out to others. And may you be held as you are held. May you be nourished as you nourish. Barbara, pioneer, activist, feminist. Your commitment to fairness, to women's leadership, and to Jewish values guides your feet as you run this race. You use your vision and relationships to weave a community that is healing the world. As this water passes over your hands, I offer you this blessing. May your spirit, passion, fierce intellect, and huge loving heart ripple out in waves to generations of women to come. May fairness be the order of the day, and may you know and enjoy the role you have played in bringing that day into being. Urvashi, attorney, organizer, social entrepreneur. You dug the foundation of LGBTQ justice movements that supports the possibility of a society that fully loves all of our LGBTQ siblings. As this water passes over your hands, I offer you this blessing. May you feel the connection between the work you started and the possibilities that exist today. May your wisdom provide the light that shows us the way. So welcome back. We are live at Auburn with Catherine for her water blessing. Catherine. Innovator. Visionary. Beloved. You called forth a multi-faith, multi-racial movement for justice. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Your commitment to bridging divides and holding the complexity of many faiths and experiences has shaped Auburn Seminary as we trouble the waters and heal the world. Ready? As this water passes over your dear, dear hands, we offer you this blessing. May you find joy in movement as you continue to grow into the call of your leadership. And may your relationships hold you with care and love to meet everything to come. Mm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Beloveds, now we'd like to bring over one of our dear sisters, Blamo Jari Briggs, Director of Strategic Partnerships at Auburn. Following her words, we'll hear some gorgeous singing from members of the Middle Church Choir. So Blamo, in the spirit of all that we have been celebrating today, who is your friend for life? 
Well, first, let me say, Lisa and Mackie, I am so thrilled to be with, here with you in this moment right now. Mm -hmm. um, when I think about my friends for life, there are many, but most on my mind is my seven-year-old son, Blake, and our new puppy, Russell. I've been with Auburn for six years now, and I remain committed because at Auburn, we are working every day to build a world where my son will survive and thrive, and there will be no question that he belongs. As a mother of a black son, I know that in this world, there are no guarantees for children like Blake. That is why I'm asking you to give now by texting LOC to 44321 or visiting auburnseminary.org backslash LOC25. As a matter of fact, Auburn is where I participated in my first protest marches. First, when we sent two buses to the Women's March in D.C., and second, when my Auburn colleagues and I left our desks to protest the police killings of Philando Castile and Alton Sterling. We marched from Union Square to Times Square, and Catherine was not only with us, she encouraged us and led the charge. Lisa, you were there too. But change involves more than just marching. It means having the faith, commitment, vision, and hope to stay in the work of justice for as long as it takes. At Auburn, we know that faith has driven bigotry, supremacy, and violence, and also that the best of our faiths have inspired compelling visions and acts of social justice. That's why I'm asking you to give to Auburn today so that we can continue to equip, catalyze, and connect leaders of faith and moral courage to change this world. I urge you to text now and give a gift at any level that is meaningful to you. With your support, we at Auburn nurture communities, networks, and movements, locally and nationally, and we work to change narratives by bringing a moral and ethical voice to the public square. Yes, we have a new administration in the White House, and an Auburn senior fellow, the Reverend Dr. Raphael Warnock in the Senate. But there's still a ways to go. We're still very much a country divided. White supremacy is still rooted deep. Income equality is still very much on the rise. That's why we need your support today and for the long haul. Help us create a multiracial, multi-faith democracy. Help us leverage faith and spirit for justice. Help us keep hope alive so that my son Blake and all of our children can not only survive, but thrive and flourish. Text the number on the screen or go to our website to give right now. We thank you so much for all those who have given already, but please don't stop. <laughs> Your support means the world to us and we are so grateful to call you our friends for life. Now, I'm going to let Lisa and Mackie and the Middle Church Choir take us home. Thank you again for taking this moment to be with us. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Blamo. And thank you to everyone who has tuned in today to celebrate with us. Thank you to everyone who has donated before, during, or will donate just after we wrap up this event. Thank you to each of our honorees for being a part of this special occasion and for continuing to fight to make a wider way for love and justice. Before we go, you know I cannot let you say nice things about me, Lisa Anderson, in front of all these nice people <laughs> and not share how you give me life. Lisa, it's been a couple decades now together to behold the way you love the people you love is a miracle. And the way you have risen up into leadership for us and for your people, it gives me faith. You give me life, Lisa Anderson, mm. and I love you so much. Oh, I love you. <laughs> All right, and now, as promised, we want to introduce members from the Middle Church Choir one last time. Be sure to keep watching after this closing song as we hear from you about your friends for life. Mm. <laughs> Glory. 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 One day when the glory comes 
It will be ours. It will be ours one day. When the war is won, we will be sure. We will be sure. We will be sure. We will. 